one of the people who has been diligent in documenting what Unitarian Universalists have and have not done with regard to issues involving race is Mark Morrison Reed. Most of you who are here know that. You've picked up one or more of the books that Mark has produced for us that have educated us, deepened our understanding. What you may not know is that Mark is fun to work with. <laughs> Mark, I discovered, has a gift of asking questions, penetrating questions, that make one think hard, re-examine assumptions, and I have no idea what he's going to do to us this morning, <laughs> but he's probably going to ask some questions that make us rethink more than one thing. So, with great pleasure, I present to you the Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed, adjunct faculty at Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago. Mark. <laughs> Okay. Wow, thank you, thank you. So, um, so, you know, you're already getting acculturated, uh, um, uh, how many of you saw the, the movie uh, Selma? I'm just, uh, oh, well, boy, almost everybody. Okay, okay, well. Yeah, you know, one of the things you didn't, uh, could you tell how about civil rights time in the movie? That it was never on time? I don't know, you could, you, you, you could, I, you, that's, uh, that's one of the things you couldn't, in movies you can't tell that because they got to keep it going, but that's not the way it was, it, apparently. You know something else, um, that something about the, you didn't hear anything about the Second World War in the movie, did you? Uh, you didn't expect to, I bet. You know something else, the, the film is an approximation, you know that? You notice it's an approximation of the truth. It's hovering there between fiction and reality. It isn't really what happened, but it actually did catch the essence of what happened. And this is fine. It's okay. It's okay. After 50 years, we're mythologizing these events. We're mythologizing them. We're, we might say we're spinning a civil rights saga. And I don't use the term myth pejoratively. Myths, what are they? They're narratives. They're the stories, right? That, uh, that give our self-understanding co coherence and give voice to our values. And this is inevitable, and it is good, or, yeah, well, or. Yeah, so the, the film, the film judiciously uses creative license to point to what is true. The trouble is the events, the context, the complexity, but that's all that's, Stripped out, it's stripped out. For a historian, the movie is more like a snapshot. You know, it's more like a snapshot of what happened in Selma, because Selma doesn't make sense without World War II. So, my uncle, my uncle Lloyd, he enlisted, was in his last year of college, he trained in Utah. He was sent to Camp Lee, Virginia. He ended up in Elgin Field, Florida. There, segregation was enforced. 
Colored soldiers were barred from the movie theater and the PX, but guess not who? The German POWs. Yeah, 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 yeah. His unit, the 1898 Aviation Engineering Battalion, landed in southern Italy, began building airfields. Uncle Lloyd saw the Color 366 Infantry Regiment, that's the first all Negro regular army unit commanded by only Negro officers. They saw, of course, the Nisei 442, 422nd, Japanese Americans, right? Second, made a second generation, and the most, most decorated force of any in the army. And to their amazement, the Brazilian troops. You know why the Brazilian troops were amazing? They were completely integrated. The USO, right? The USO, the United Service Organization, which provided R&R &R for the troops that were supposed to, refused to serve Negroes. Uncle Lloyd's buddy simply went to the British equivalent. Indeed, outside the U.S., so Lloyd didn't encounter discrimination in Italy. He wrote home to his, gra his my, mother, my grandmother, his mother, over here, it's good for a change. There is no obvious racial prejudice from the Italians. They could not afford it now. And there, and there is none from the white troops around. This is a relief after the bigotry in the states, particularly where we come from. That was Washington, D.C. So I listened to my Uncle Lloyd's stories and I learned, yet there was much I didn't know and less, even less than I understood. So what did I know? I knew that during World War II, the US Army was segregated, but I didn't understand that the over 900,000 black GIs were usually consigned to serve as stevedores, laborers, cooks. I knew about the Tuskegee Airmen. I knew about the Nisei 442nd, but not about the half a million, half a million Mexican Americans or the 100,000 Becerios brought from Mexico to grow and harvest the crops the US needed. How selective our memory. How short-lived our gratitude. How perverse to demonize immigrants we still and still need, still need, and so mean-spirited, what, to shut the door, shut the door of a country full of the descendants of immigrants now that we're here. Oh. And you know what else I didn't know about? I didn't know about the 25,000 Native American soldiers. So I knew that the war led to African Americans getting jobs that they had never had before because the war effort needed them. I knew African American scientists had worked on the atomic bomb. I didn't know it was only 20. I didn't know about the Hanford workers who would help mine the uranium. I didn't know about the Committee on Fair Employment Practices, much less that President Roosevelt's hand had been forced in 1942 by who? A. Philip Randolph when he threatened to lead the first march on Washington, he said 50,000 African-Americans were gonna to go to Washington and you know the Nazi propaganda machine would have loved that. So I knew about the GI Bill, but not about the inordinate number of African-American soldiers who received dishonorable discharges, 22% of the you know of those who got it when they only made up 6.5% of the forces triple and then of course they weren't eligible for the GI bill i knew my uncle lloyd had used that to finish school but i didn't realize that the government also guaranteed a housing loan that was another of the benefits and maybe that's because so few african americans could access it because Banks wouldn't make loans to people moving into African-American communities. You see, covenants, by then illegal, and real estate practices kept African-Americans out of white neighborhoods and out of suburbs. So even though I, you know, when even I learned that I didn't get, I didn't really get it, I didn't understand the implications. First, it forced African-Americans into purchasing homes on contract. 
contracts were often predatory, miss a single miss a payment, and you could lose everything because you had no equity. Second, loans determine what? They determine not getting one, determine where, what neighborhood you could live in, and therefore what schools your children attended. So if you want one explanation of the enduring income gap between black and white, you can start there. Racism, that was and is built into this system gave an additional boost to white Americans in their accrual of wealth and educational advantage. And this was an advantage they took and take for granted. It fed the belief, they bled, fed the belief, a false one, that their prosperity was due solely to what? Their industriousness with this implicit of negative assumptions about African-American work ethic. Euro-Americans don't want to know this. Why? Well, you know, in correcting the American narrative, it dispels this kind of bootstrap myth. It calls an inflated self-understanding into question and along with undermining the self-interest, it raises difficult moral questions. Where is the remorse? How does one atone? Should there be reparations? What might they look like? Knowing and it stirs up guilt and confusion it's so uncomfortable. Better not to know. World War II is rich, rich with irony. What do you have? African Americans in uniform on the factory floors defending America's democratized racism from racist fascism. Right, and black soldiers returned home to face what they had been fighting, where? Abroad. Serving in the 82nd Railhead Company, Charles Patterson, Unitarian, came ashore at Anzio. As they fought their way up the spine of Italy, his company was literally wiped out. <coughs> wiped out. He was sent home with a silver star, bronze star, purple heart. After recovering, he was assigned to escort Sherman POWs to prison camps in Alabama. In Birmingham, the Germans ate where? In the white section of the bus station. But when the, not the black soldiers guarding them, and when Sergeant Patterson leaned over to drink from a white fountain, only fountain, a white man slammed his head into the spout. And as he stood there dazed and bleeding, Patterson was surrounded by white folks who cursed and threatened him. And he said later he was lucky he wasn't lynched. And others, others didn't escape that fate. So why, why am I telling you these war stories? You know, it's not just because of the injustice that they describe. No, no, it's about the lessons they offer. One lesson, one lesson is about unintended consequences. I mean, World War II is what made Selma possible. The war gave African Americans opportunities that they would not have otherwise had. The slogan, you know the slogan was double V, right? Double V, victory, victory at home and abroad. They returned to discrimination, but they returned with changed expectations, with new sense of confidence, forged at a terrible price. The experience changed the self-perception and worldview, and this gave momentum to an emerging civil rights movement. And they weren't alone. 
may run alone in being transformed by the war. The experience of World War II also changed the worldview of many Euro-Americans. When the scales fell from their eyes, they were shocked at what they saw, the oppression and brutality on their own doorstep. So this actually did this bore directly on what happened at Selma. The afternoon of March 7, 1965, the protest march from Selma to Montgomery began and was savagely ended. That evening, ABC interrupted the broadcast of Judgment at Norberg, I don't know, with Spencer Tracy. It's drama about the war crime trials in the post-Nazi era. And they cut from that to footage of the barbar barbarous attack on the black citizens of Selma. The connection couldn't be missed. Couldn't be missed. Ethel Gorman, president of the Unitarian Church of Birmingham, recalled that two days later in a meeting, before we got down to business, we expressed our horror at the scenes in Selma which we had seen on TV. We felt shame for our state as well as pity for the victims and fear because law enforcement officers acted like Nazi storm troopers. Carl, Carl, you need Carl Ulrich. Where's Carl? Put your hand to Carl. There he is, Carl Ulrich. Carl Ulrich was the minister in Louisville at this point, Kentucky. This is what he wrote to his brother. The tactic, the white power structure of there is to instill fear in the heart of the Negroes. And this has been the tactic for the last hundred years. And we in the rest of the country have just ignored it. But after it was so vividly shown to us, when everyone saw it clearly on TV and with the temper of the country, it was almost impossible to ignore. It's hard to believe, but the fact is, in America, there is a police state, and the troopers are not there to protect the Negro. Three days after Bloody Sunday, a minister from Long Island stood at the Selma wall facing a phalanx of police and had to keep telling himself because he couldn't believe it. This is the USA. This is the USA. One white Alabaman would later compare the white Southerners to the majority of Germans who were good Germans during the Holocaust. You know, you couldn't help but make the connection. I mean, March 1965, the 20th anniversary of the end of the war was at hand. The trauma of the war years had touched literally every adult and was easily evoked. They remembered the sacrifices made, and many were aware of the consequences of inaction in the face of tyranny. In forcing people into new and unfamiliar situations, the war disrupted the status quo. Whether it was women working in the factories or men fighting, everyone endured, changed, suffered loss, defending what their values, and many were transformed. Nonetheless, most white Americans fancifully, fancifully hoped that things would return to normal. That is how they had been, but not African Americans. You know, there, there was no going back. The protest of the brave citizens of Selma only makes sense when it is understood as a consequence of the second World War. Can I have some water? Oh. oh there. Thank you. Thank you. So. Today. Yeah, today. You know, we assume, we assume what? I'll tell you what we assume. We assume, I know exactly what you guys assume. We saw the outpouring of support and the rush to Selma was because of what? The righteousness of the cause and the magnitude of the injustice. You couldn't miss it, you heard that, couldn't miss it. But neither, neither those, nor the changes 
stemming from the war really, really explain the response. They don't. It was, of course, because of the cause. But it was relationships that compelled them to go. The connection of one person to another. 4, 57 a.m., Monday morning, Martin Luther King Jr. dispatched a telegram calling on all faith traditions to send clergy to join the citizens of Selma in another march. Among those who were sent, who, to whom it was sent, was the UUA president, Dana McLean Greeley. And among those who responded were James Reeb, Orloff Miller, Clark Olson, actually, we, oh, you guys stand up, right, right, who was that? Bill, Bill, stand up, Orloff, Dick Gilbert, Dick Leonard, who else is here? Jim Hobart, Clark Olson, Ken McLean, who else is here? Who am I? Carl, come on, Carl, stand up. Those of you, stand up, please. to talk with Jim Reeve was leading a housing program for the American Friends Service Committee in Boston. Living in the black neighborhood of Dorchester, his children enrolled in predominantly black schools. He was totally immersed in the black empowerment, in empowering the black community. That Sunday evening, Jim and Marie Reeve were having dinner with the Webbs. Ted Webb was the UUA Mass Bay District Director. Together they watched the new re newsreels of the attack on television. Orloff Miller, the UUA Director of UU College Centers, and his wife Mary Ann were having dinner with an interracial couple. They watched the slaughter on TV. The next morning when the call came to Miller, to Orloff, who was on the sixth floor at our UUA headquarters at 25 Beacon Street, rushed down to meet with Homer Jack, the director of the Department of Social Responsibility. Homer handed Orloff the telegram in the margin Dana Greeley had written, see if Homer would send out the alert to get some of our men to go and tell, tell Webb. Soon they were all working the phones, UUs were preparing to go. Homer Jack, Homer Jack, first met Martin Luther King in 1954 when Jack and two other colleagues had been among the first white clergy to go south in their support of the Montgomery bus boycott. That summer, Jack had preached at, for King at, I'll spit it out, at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He'd preached about Martin, or he'd preached about Mahatma Gandhi. In 1950. Seven, they had traveled to Ghana together for the independence celebration. In 1958, Jack visited Homer in the, I'm, I'm sorry, Homer visited Jack in, no, I'll get this out. Homer visited Dr. King in the hospital in New York City after he was stabbed. MLK also knew Gene Reeves. He called Gene, said, Gene, I need you here. He said, Martin, I'll be there as soon as I can. There's another one called Webb. It was Webb, who in this case met Ted Webb, who called Jim Reeb. It was probably Dana McLean Greeley who called his own nephew, Brad Greeley. Brad then phoned his colleague in Concord, Arthur Jellis, and asked, shall we go? And they went. Orloff was director of the Office of College Centers. He started calling the college centers across the country. He also called his classmate, Jack Taylor, who was serving in Champaign-Urbana. Jack didn't want to go, but Orloff called and Jack went. Jack Taylor, Orloff, Reeves, MLK, all had attended Boston School of Theology. 
There's a pattern here, gang. There's a pattern here. I, you know, you're, you're bright. You, you see, you see where it, what happened here, right? By Monday evening, Jack was already in Selma. Brad Greeley, Reeb, Orloff, 10 other colleagues and UUA staff were off flying to Atlanta. What took them to Selma? Come, you know already, you know where we're going with this. What took them to Selma? Relationships, thank you. It was relationships. For others, it was not a matter of being called, but being sent. Dave Johnson in Bloomington, in Indiana, arrived at church for a meeting, was told by his board, you are going to represent us. And here is the money for the ticket. And by midnight, he and a church member were on a plane. So too often, we credit the righteousness of the cause and overemphasize the ideological commitment to progressive values and laud the moral courage, but these do not explain what happened. It was about being in what? Relationship. So what do you do when your friend calls and says, I'm going? Join me. What do you do when that call comes? You go. You know, and it was no different for Clark Olson. It was no different for Clark Olson. Who, you know, Clark was walking beside Orloff. It was, it, was, it was James Reeb, Orloff Miller, Clark Olson. They were walking together when the three of them were attacked in Selma. Olson heard about King's call on the radio call the Selma. And by the time he, and he wanted to go, but he didn't know how he was going to go because he didn't have the money. And the time he got home, a call had come and church members had already called and said, we'll pay for the ticket. Not even a request. He got home and the money was there. Prior to the conclusion of the march to Montgomery, members of the congregation in Park Forest challenged their minister, David Bumba, to go. They went, they, the group that was there, they listened to his reasons, his excuses for not going. And then they informed him that they had an airline ticket for him, and they asked, would he use it? <laughs> and he knew that this decision would shape his life. And he said, yes. And along with four or five members of his congregation, he flew to Alabama. So what do you do when someone says go? Or go for us? Or go with us? You go. Because it's about being in relationship. Now, so, so. Yeah, Gordon knows me pretty well. With whom might you, you know, who might you, whom are you in relationship? That's what my question is. That's the big question. With whom are you in relationship? Who is it that might call and say, shall we go? And what are you going to say? Yes. Who is that? So I will tell you something else about the many who went to Selma for that second attack, second attempt, and for subsequently to go across the William Pettus Bridge. They went not only because of the relationships to one another, but because of their relationships to African Americans. James Reeb was completely committed to working in the black community. He had been at All Souls when he was the associate minister there, and even and he wasn't enough for him. He had to be fully immersed in it, and that's how he ended up in Dorchester. Orloff Miller's roommate at Boston University was an African American, and when Orloff went to his wedding, he found himself the only Euro-American there. Clark Olson and Bill Jones built a close relationship working together as student ministers. Gene Reeves knew Martin Luther King from BU and later worked with Coretta King in Atlanta. 
Jack Taylor's mentor was Howard Thurman. In 1942, Homer Jack had been among the founders of the Congress of Racial Equality. Fred Lipp, who went even though a board member told him that he might cost him his job. Fred had attended Tuskegee Institute during his junior year of college. And Viola Luzo, not only had she joined the NAACP, her best friend was Sarah Evans, an African-American woman. Charles Blackburn, who was the minister in Huntville, and he had, he'd marched the day before Bloody Sunday, had been the only Euro-American student at Howard School of Divinity in 1958-59. Theirs were not casual relationships to African Americans. And so this brings me back to the question, with whom are you in relationship? To whom have you reached out? With whom do you socialize? Is their class, is their culture, their race different than your own? To whom have you built bridges? To whom have you built bridges? Building bridges between our divisions. I reach out to you, won't you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony again. Building bridges between our divisions. I reach out to you, won't you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony. So, to whom have you been building bridges? To whom do you want to build bridges? What relationships would make a difference in your life, might, might even transform your life? Flying into Alabama from California, Clark Olson arrived late but caught up with his colleagues and after dinner was walking beside Orloff and James Reeb when they were attacked. Asked Clark why he went and he puts it succinctly, I decided to go. I decided to go. The why, you know, the whys that get offered later, you know, his explanations, you know, it's actually a guess, you know that? It's actually a guess, it's, a, it's an approximation, it's a, it's a hunch, it's a rationalization. It's always secondary to the decision itself. It's about deciding to go. It's about showing up. It's not about, this is tough for us, gang. It's not about being deliberative. It's not about being careful. It's not about being rational. No, 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 it's about feeling compelled. You feel, it's about feeling gay. It's not about our minds, it's about our feelings. It's tough for us, it's not our tradition. You know, it's not our tradition, but that's what drives us to our greatness. It's about feeling compelled. You know, I don't know, I cannot know you know, what, for you, what's pressing for you? What's pressing in your region of the country? What's pressing for your congregation? I don't know, is it immigration reform? Is it voter suppression? Is it the environment? Is it disability rights? State-sanctioned violence like, against the unarmed like Michael Brown and Eric Gardner? Or the slangs of officers Liu and Ramos? Yes, 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 yes. Black lives matter. And as we learned, Muslim lives matter. And Hispanic lives matter. And those of police officers matter. 
What I know is that when there's a bridge, when there's a connection, a relationship, its existence is what compels you to act. Without it, the pull is yet to remain an observer, outraged, distressed, but still by you more gesticulate rather than act. Now, I cannot know when another situation like Selma will arise again. We can't, none of us, neither, none of you know when that's going to happen. But I can give you the names of a dozen UUs who helped found NAACP chapters, chapters of the Urban League, chapters of CORE. In the South, they started Human Relation Council. I mean, we inordinately number, we help found organizations like that. And I can tell you the numbers of another dozen or more who are on the local boards. And already mentioned the personal ties that many of those who went to Selma to black folks. Whether institutional or personal, they were in relationship to African Americans. That bridge was there and when the time came, it was easy, if scary, to go. So I'm back to the question. You know what the question is. With whom are you in relationship? Or, or what's getting in the way of your making that relationship? No, it takes a little courage, it takes a little courage to step out of our comfort zones. You know, because well, hell, we've built them into fortresses. It takes some courage because if we're honest, the unknown is scary. Thank you, yes. I mean, venturing into unfamiliar settings, we feel off balance, and we don't like that gang. You know, we, we, structure our, we structure our lives to keep that from happening. Situations not in our control, we don't like that either. You know, aging's tough for us because we don't like being out of control. I mean, this, these are, everybody has troubles. You use that particularly have troubles with these issues. <laughs> the rule, you know, and then we go in places where we're not certain what the rules are, you know, and we get a, a little, little anxious, <laughs> little anxious, except we avoid them so often we don't feel anxious very often because, <laughs> And what, doubts? Do you know doubts, niggly doubts eat at you? And you know, that, that's good. And it's important that we feel those things. Being careful and being cautious and hiding our vulnerabilities is not a recipe for change and transformation. <laughs> what are we here for? What are we here? Some already said, we're not here for a celebration. We're here to reconsecrate ourselves. Reconsecrate, but transformation, you must to be transformed, to recommit ourselves, right? To consecrate ourselves, you have to commit and engage. And then let the awkwardness and the anxiety and the relationship reach in and change you. You know, you can turn difference into dialogue, confusion into understanding, distance into camaraderie, but you have to stop making excuses and engage. And engage. You can't, you can do, you know, you can do this. And it's, see, you, you can do this, right, Rob? We know we can do this. Because what do you guys have? What do you have? You have beloved community. That's why you're here. That's what brought you together. That's what you have beloved community. What does beloved community do? Well, with the community is a resource. The feelings of reluctance, the sense of vulnerability, the doubts and dilemmas you will face and the ways 
you'll get wounded and I can guarantee you, you will be wounded in doing this work, but these can be transformed and they become ways of healing yourselves and your community and the world. But, but, with whom are you in relationship? A relationship that would compel you to take risk. The first Sunday in December, I was at Noof. Noof. That's the Netherlands Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Amsterdam. During the sharing of Joys and Concerns, Bill, an older Euro-American male, got up and lit a candle for Ferguson and Michael Brown. I was touched. I was surprised. When I told him so after the service, he said, my three grandsons are black. When someone is that close, the risk doesn't matter. The risk no longer matters. They mean nothing. You know, in the context of relationship, it's, that, it's all, it's not even secondary. When the other is your brother, your sister, your friend, your grandson, you're compelled to act. And the thing is, the wider, the wider, the wider your circle of friends, the more often that's going to happen to you. That's the reality. The wider, the more engaged you are in life and with people, the more often that's going to happen. Why? Because we care. So I come back. I ask you, with whom are you in relationship? And what of your relationship to yourself? Place yourselves in situations where friendships can evolve. You know, that's all I'm really asking for, not to save the world just to place yourself in these situations. You don't place yourself because they scare you a little. Do that, and when then you act on behalf, behalf of justice, you'll not be acting for others, but with them, with them, and for yourself. The outpouring of support in the rush to Selma was, of course, about the righteousness of the cause and the magnitude of the injustice. But more important was what preceded the moment of decision. For those who lived there in Selma, those relationships gave them courage. For those who came there, the relationships compelled them to go. It's all about connection of one person to another. Placing the cause first can lead you astray. You know it will. And ideological commitments will certainly lead you astray because it places right belief before right relationship. No, not by any means necessary. The ends always manif are manifestation of the means. Being in relationship, that is working together to address a problem, that's different. It's, kind of, it's creating a space, a creative, shared, non-ideological non kind of synergy. There's no us, them, it's we, and from which that, that, that can see alternatives can spring forth, and you find solidarity in working together toward common cause. You don't know the answer, but the answer comes out of your relationship, which is, I think, what happened for a time 
in Selma in 1965. Such a commitment is fueled by a yearning, a yearning for meaning in our lives, or if I turn that around, our need to make meaning of our lives, make meaning of our lives. Conscience urges us, for we have, yes, we've dreamt of better days, a more just tomorrow, and we still dream, we still dream. Whenever my life ends, I want the comfort of knowing I poured it out. I poured it out for the values I hold dear and for the people I love. That's all I need to know when my day's end. You know, it's, what is this about? It's about being in love. It's about being in love with one another. Yes, and with oneself too, and with this world to which we are wed. It's about being in love. That's all we're talking about. Because once we're in love, what do you do? You take, you take any risk necessary. You know, that's what living fully and deeply and with integrity demands. That's what it demands. Not standing on this, not just standing on this side, but being compelled and consumed by love. Consumed by love. Being in relationship, in beloved, beloved community, is essential. For alone, our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen, and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. But together, our vision widens, and our strength is renewed. And the people said, and the people said, amen. and the people said, amen, 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 amen. A little louder, amen, 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 amen. amen. With your heart now, amen, 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 full of hope now, amen, 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 like a prayer now, amen. Last time now, amen, 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 amen. Thank you. That's a good Mark, Morrison Reed, yes!